Hi there folks, this is uh, Mr. Hopper and this is going to be a brief review for human biology test number one. This would be covering lectures one and two. Now, I have here in front of me some brief notes that I've made about what I find to be the most important concepts uh, in these first two lectures on this first exam. They are in an approximation of order, but I will be jumping around here ever so slightly. Uh, again, I just kind of write these things up as I go. So without further ado, let's lay into this thing and see where things fall. All right, first things first. Uh, if I were you, I'd have a good understanding of the introduction to human biology. What is the hierarchy of complexity? You know, you are an organism made up of organ systems. Those organ systems being made up of organs, organs made of tissues, tissues made of cells, cells being made up of organelles, organelles being made up of molecules, and then those molecules being made up of atoms. And we're going to talk at length about, you know, sort of what an atom is and how they behave and what they do here in just a second. But for time being, a good grasp of the hierarchy of complexity is meaningful. If I were you, I would have a good understanding of homeostasis. Understand that there is positive and negative feedback, and maybe some examples of positive and negative feedback. So when you regulate your body's temperature, when you regulate your blood glucose or, or blood sugar levels, like tell me how this works. Tell me about positive feedback. Tell me about negative feedback and what those terms mean. What is homeostasis? Tell me about uh, diffusion and osmosis and and active transport, and bulk transit, and all that fun stuff. So, so let's have that conversation. There are passive transport mechanisms which do not require energy. And then there are active transport mechanisms that do require energy. In terms of passive transport, if I were you, I would understand diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion is the movement of particles from high concentration to low concentration, whereas osmosis is the movement of water to follow solutes through a semi-permeable membrane, like water flowing in and out of your red blood cells is a wonderful example of osmosis, in essence, stabilizing water content. So diffusion, movement from high concentration to low concentration of particles. Compare diffusion to primary active transport. Primary active transport is using energy, ATP, your energy source, to actively pump materials from low concentration into high concentration to actively move things into concentration that would be primary active transport but again the rub to this is primary active transport this is moving very small things kind of one at a time piecemeal if you will then of course there is vesicular or bulk transport in vesicular or bulk transport uh, you need to have a good grasp of moving individual very large molecules into or out of the cell that would be endocytosis versus exocytosis and that, that this is a still a means of active transport this is going to be using energy all right good yeah that's a good way to look at all this moving on into chemistry yeah. so in the world of chemistry i would have a good idea of what it means to be an organic molecule versus an inorganic molecule just uh you know give me an idea of what are some examples of each of these so a nice inorganic molecule will be something like water. You know that water is incredibly important and gives some unique attributes. And these unique attributes of water give rise to your personal unique attributes. And then further, uh, there are organic molecules. Organic molecules are going to be carbon-containing, and they're going to be incredibly large by comparison to inorganic molecules. Good examples of organic molecules would be proteins, you know, your nucleic acids and carbohydrates and lipids. Now, in and of this, you need to know the monomeric subunits of all these organic molecules. So, know about proteins being made up of amino acids and what peptide bonds are. What's a primary strand, secondary, tertiary. In lipids, be able to tell me what a triglyceride is in solid versus liquid form. Tell me what steroids are in terms of, like, sex hormones, in terms of vitamin D and what vitamin D is good for. Like, you need to give me a nice understanding of these as a concept. All right. Now, in chemistry, one of the first things that we did was we talked about atoms. If I were you, I would know that protons and neutrons are going to be found in the central core of an atom and that those protons and neutrons have mass. 
I would know that the electrons are found on the outside of the atom. You know, it's electrons on the outside that give rise to all uh, chemical bonding, if you will. So those electrons flying around the outside of the atom, they, they tend to display a negative charge, whereas protons in the core of the atom display a positive charge. These are all important concepts. If given the opportunity, you need to be able to tell me what an atomic number is. I would like for you to have an understanding of atomic mass also. So atomic number is basically the number of protons of an atom, whereas the atomic mass is the combined number of protons and neutrons. Just, just understand these things as a general concept. The nature of these atoms, these smallest units of elements. All right. You need to know about ionic bonding versus covalent bonding. Understanding that in an ionic bond, an electron is stolen away from one atom and given to another, which results in a charge variation as seen on one atom versus another, versus covalent bonding, where electrons are shared. Now, two types of covalent bonding. There is polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. Nonpolar covalent bonds, the sharing of electrons is equal, whereas in a polar covalent bond, the sharing of electrons is not equal. And the side effect of unequal sharing of electrons in polar covalent bonds means that the uh, individual molecules, which are polar covalent, display charge variations. And these charge variations, like on a water molecule, give rise to weak attractions that we call hydrogen bonds. You need to know what a hydrogen bond is. You need to know where you might see these. You need to know that these give rise to the unique attributes of water, and thus your unique attributes. You need to know the unique attributes of water, and thus your unique attributes. You need to understand that hydrogen bonds help hold proteins in their unique three-dimensional shapes, helps hold DNA in its unique three-dimensional shape. Hydrogen bonding is very important for us. All right, moving on, uh, you need to know what a polymer is and what a monomer is, and in and of this conversation of monomers and polymers, you need to know about hydrolysis versus dehydration synthesis. So you go and you eat a hamburger. You're going to break that hamburger down into its smaller subunits, into, from polymers down into monomers, using hydrolysis reactions in your gut. You will then move small particles into your bloodstream, carry them around the body wherever they're necessary, and then use dehydration synthesis to rebuild large polymers in your tissues to do jobs for you. So what's a monomer? What's a polymer? What do I mean when I say hydrolysis? That means to break something using water. Or dehydration synthesis, that is to make something by taking water away. You need to be able to tell me about these. What are the monomers for the four major classes of organic molecules? What are those four major classes of organic molecules? Tell me about the monomers and polymers that we talked about in each of these. A good example of this might be, you know, glucose, which makes up your blood sugar, which is a carbohydrate, and how you can, you as a mammal can put together lots of glucose molecules in order to make glycogen, which is a polymer in mammalian tissues, or alternatively, if you're a potato, you can string together glucose molecules to make starch, all right? So if you eat a potato, you're eating starch. You will then break that starch down via hydrolysis reactions in your gut, put that glucose into your bloodstream, and then it can go to your liver to make glycogen. All right? Glycogen made by hydro I'm sorry, dehydration synthesis. So just have an understanding of um, glucose, of glycogen, how that relates to blood sugar, and the hormone insulin, which kind of helps to regulate all this, is meaningful to understand. Uh, let's see, what else? So, like, DNA is a good example of this. In, in DNA, you need to understand that your DNA is simply a code for making proteins, uh, that your DNA is found in the nuclei of your cells, and that it's a very large mo molecule that can't leave the nucleus of your cells. So, yet again, I will say uh, DNA, code for making proteins, and... I'm going to be very honest with you here. You need to take me, this is kind of moving into cells, but you'll get my point. You need to take me from DNA to RNA, which is an intermediate molecule, to protein synthesis by a ribosome. You could call this trans, um, transcription and translation. So use those terms, transcription and translation. So laying down primary polypeptide strands, in other words, uh, peptide bonding amino acids together with a ribosome. 
and how that leads to the production of protein in the rough ER, in the rough ER, using ribosomes. And then those can be offloaded to a, like a Golgi body, as an example, uh, in order to do some packaging and moving things around. What I'm trying to say is, moving into cells here, that you need to know uh, the function of the nucleus in terms of holding your DNA, how DNA can be transcribed into RNA, how that RNA can leave the nucleus and go out into the rough ER to meet up with a ribosome for translation, which would make a primary polypeptide that could then be sent off to the Golgi body for finalization to make a functioning protein that could then be released from the cell via exocytosis. Just have an understanding of protein synthesis. This is a very important concept. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. All right, um, moving into cells a little bit here and tissues. What are the different tissue types, right? Like, what is an epithelia? What are the key characteristics of something that makes it an epithelium? What's a connective tissue? Give me examples of connective tissue. What are the key characteristics of something that would make it a connective tissue? What are the base concepts? Just basic concepts here, folks. That's what I'm looking for. So, uh, moving into cells, all cells have a phospholipid bilayer. Know what I mean when I'm talking about phospholipids. Know that these will form up this bilayer, hydrophilic uh, heads versus hydrophobic tails, and what that kind of indicates about your cell membranes being selectively permeable. Uh, know what the, uh, like moving into the cell, like what is cytoplasm, the sort of fluid inside the cell in which everything floats? What are ribosomes in terms of making proteins? What's a Golgi body in terms of packaging proteins? Uh, what are mitochondria in terms of making ATP? Like, sell your respiration, folks. Have an idea of how this stuff works. All right. Uh, in and of connective tissues, be able to tell me the difference between the fibers that are found here. So what is collagen fiber versus elastic fibers? Uh, on cell membranes, be able to tell me about cell membrane modifications. Where would you find cilia and what do they do? Where would you find microvilli and what do they do? What are desmosomes? What are tight junctions? You know, th these are good things to know moving forward. All right, let's see what else we've got here. All right, walk me through the cellular life cycle. You know, tell me about the difference between, like, what is mitosis versus what is interphase? Where would the cell be doing the vast majority of its work? Um, just general understanding of the cellular life cycle. Know that some cells go through this cellular life cycle quite quickly, whereas other cells in your body take a very long time or never go through this life cycle at all. In and of this, tell me about some different types of cells that we talked about in class. Tell me about red blood cells, erythrocytes, and, and sort of what they do. Tell me about white blood cells or, or, or um, leukocytes and sort of what they do. What are neurons in terms of nervous tissue and what does it do? What is an osteocyte in terms of bone cells and what do they do? Chondrocytes and cartilage. Just some cells and sort of what makes them unique and or interesting. All right, then moving on into skin a little bit here. You need to walk me through all the functions of skin. I gave you a bunch. Skin does a lot for you. You need to understand this. What do I mean when I say it's a barrier against UV radiation? What is melanin in reference to protecting you from UV radiation? What is melanin really doing for you? What is melanin protecting? What's it trying to keep from you? What's it trying to give you? Tell me about the synthesis of vitamin D. Tell me about why folic acid is so important to us. Tell me about the role of melanin in protecting us from these things. Um, tell me about, let's see what else we have here, your various skin-based glands. What's an eccrine gland? Where do you find them? How numerous are they? Apocrine glands, sebaceous glands being oil glands. Like I want to know about these. What are some things that can go wrong with them? What do they help with? If you get hot, which ones are activated? Uh, which ones become active during puberty? Like, Just give me a good idea of these glands and kind of what they do. And uh, I tell you what, folks. That, that's Oh, and tell me a little bit about burns. And in particular, you need to be able to recognize different types of skin cancer. I find this to be important. You need to have a good understanding of what to look for to recognize cancerous portions of the skin because there's a solid chance that you might really need this knowledge later in life. 
So now's the time to learn these things. So get on it and make sure you understand the concept. And folks, I think that's a really good review for this test. Between this file, this audio, and your study guide, which is in Canvas, and your quizzes, which I've already put up, and your five paragraphs, which are incredibly important, make sure you know those five paragraphs backwards and forwards. You need to know it and be able to recount it left and right to anybody that wants to listen. Uh, between these things, you should be in pretty good shape for this exam. So thank you so much for listening. I really hope you do fantastically well. Have a wonderful